last week, Saiganesh gave such a beautiful sermon. I wasn't here, but I listened to it because these two talks are on such a continuum that it felt to me that knowing what he shared with you could be meaningful. And in fact, it was. Of course, I'm not going to try and summarize his whole talk, but I will say that he had a great inspiration to share the story of Karna, who's a character in the Mahabharata. We don't hear about him often because he's not in part of the story of the Bhagavad Gita. But um, in an interesting way, and it's meaningful, so just a tiny little summary of this part of his talk, Karna, who's actually a very good and high soul in, in many ways, and is actually born to the same mother as the uh, Gauravas, who are the good, the good people in the story of the Bhagavad Gita. Um, but through a series of events, because of when and how he was born, he's floated down the Ganges River in a basket after his birth, and he is adopted by uh, Duryodhana, who's the leader of the Kauravas. So he ends up in this story as we come to the battlefield, a very high soul who's attained a lot in life. He's lived up to, in many ways, his potential as a high soul, but then he's on the side of all that is contracting and negative. And with every other Kaurava, it's easy to say, they're bad, they're bad, they're bad. These are all of our negative qualities. Everything that takes us away from God. But he's an interesting mix because he's almost perfect. And as Sai Ganesh said, he's got strength, he's got courage, he has the best weapons, but in the end, it's not quite perfect. It never quite makes it. He can't remember what he's supposed to do. His weapons fail. Just a series of very near misses to win the battle of perfection. That's what this battle is. And it's such a great story because he, he stands out among all of the brothers as the obvious um, example of how that egoic, worldly side of each of us, no matter how perfect it is, no matter how great a job we're doing at what we're doing, it's always of the ego in this world. And it never takes us to where we're all wanting to go, which is into this oneness with God. That is the driving force of all of life, and it can't happen as long as we're making effort with the ego. Um, Swamiji speaks so beautifully about a subtlety he talks about in uh, further expansion of this reading about uh, Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci, and he speaks of how beautifully they did their art, and he says they took it right to that point of perfection that was just the perfect amount of muscle in a statue or light and dark in a painting, just the perfect amount of depth of everything you would want in art, and then there was nowhere else to go with it. It was perfect even for what it was, but it was still in this world. And it was still uh, sort of managed by, limited by, uh, all that limits us on this path when we are trying to find happiness and freedom with the ego. 
that no matter how good it gets, like karna, it will not take us. We truly cannot get there from here. And so this reading so beautifully keeps coming back to all of the ways and the reasons that we need to bring all that we can to know God, that what we're really looking for is inner communion. So Jesus, and this was very much the end of Sai Ganesh's talk, basically says, my kingdom, when Sai Ganesh was talking about how the Romans got Jesus and took him away, and even his disciples wanted him to defend himself, uh, and Jesus just wouldn't. And ultimately, he says to them, my kingdom is not of this world. He's saying, I am asking you to transcend all that you know, all of the ways that you've been trying to live. He really shakes up the status quo by his presence here. And yet he does it with wisdom, with grace, with courage, with love. And then says, my kingdom is not of this world and gives us the commandment. And that's what it is when he says, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven. And most of us would go, me? It's like, be perfect? But it's a commandment from Jesus. Would he give us a commandment to attain something that we couldn't attain? Of course not. So it stops us saying he's telling us to be perfect. So the commandment comes, and as we, all of us who are bringing our best effort to know God, we're doing all that we can to do it. And as we attend an event like last night, I wasn't there, but I'm feeling it from everybody who was there. I was listening as Helen, uh, many of you were not here, but Helen just gave a beautiful talk comparing some of what she felt last night, the, the deep need for receptivity to, well, she was talking about uh, the purification ceremony and how we come up and we're receptive. But that is what Jesus is talking about too. How many times do we hear for as many as could receive him? So this uh, uh, ability of ours to keep trying, again, I was saying through events like last night, through classes that we attend, through chanting, of course, through our meditation, we begin to have a memory of who we are. It's not that we're learning something so new, but we have these awarenesses of what we have in us, who, who we actually are, and that maybe we could be perfect as our Father in heaven. And then, so we have Jesus' commandment to do that. We have this element of memory that is really called smriti uh, in Hindu, where we just begin to remember not to learn anything new, but to remember who we are and the more energy that we bring then to our practices, to that awareness, then God's grace descends. And with all of that, we, we have the realization that within us lies the ability to do that. In that place of inner communion with the Lord, in our meditation, which Biraj's two chants, what were they about? Both of them were about meditate, go deep, do, do everything, guru given power, use it to awaken the kundalini, which is where 
that these memories are, which is what is going to allow us to find what we're looking for, to keep moving into the light. Swamiji says, inner, in a place of inner communion, God enters our heart and makes us his own. And when that happens, it allows us to see that the commandment is a reality, that we can do it. The ego couldn't realize that because what's being asked of us is something that the ego cannot imagine. It's not going to treat everybody who mistreats us well. It's not going to do that. The ego doesn't want to do that. The ego wants to fight back. It wants to resist. And yet, we're being told in the Bible, which is nothing but an ongoing instruction on how to find God. And we're being told, love those who hate you. Pray for those who have treated you badly. I've, I had an experience, I've shared it in various forms, but there was a, a, somebody in our congregation, this is many years ago now, who had the habit of approaching me all the time. The first sentence was something very negative. Always the first sentence was, like, walk in the door and tell me what I was doing wrong in a class, in a leadership role, and, and then we would go on to have a lovely visit. But in my mind, I was writing the letter I was going to write later, like, were you trying to hurt me? Were you conscious of the fact that it could be hurtful? That's what I always did with it. And one day it came to me, the way through this is by loving that soul. That's the only way through this. There is no lesson to be learned here, no lesson for you to teach. Love that soul. Now, this is one soul of all of even the people that just I come in contact with every day or over the period of months. So I began to practice exactly that, not just when I was with them, but when I wasn't with them. I would hold them up in a light. I would open my heart and I would treat them with pure kindness and respect. And in a very short period of time, any time I would see that person, I would have an experience of God's love. Why is that? That which we can love purely actually, it doesn't become the divine, but it reveals the divine. You remember the story of St. Francis? There's one story we tell often of how he kissed a leper. This is a different story, though. When he came across a leper and, again, had that initial sense of wanting to uh, be away from them because leprosy was a highly contagious disease and the lepers were treated very badly in Francis's day. They had to wear, wear bells so people could hear them coming and get out of the way of them. And Francis didn't do that with this leper, but rather he embraced him. And as the leper and he started separating from each other after the embrace, the leper became Jesus Christ, right there in Francis's presence. Why? Because that which we can love purely, beyond ego, that's what's being asked of us. Open our hearts, dive into that place of inner communion. I love what Swamiji said, God will enter our hearts and make us him. He will have us feel his love. Then I realized the more purely I can love everyone, anyone and everyone, no matter how they're treating me, 
they become the source of my being able to uh, see God, to feel God. That's the goal of life. Everything that happens to us, everything we have to say to ourselves, this is guru-given, God-given. Helen had a prayer outside this morning as we started the fire ceremony. And part of her prayer was, let me meet every challenge with the consciousness of your presence. And I thought, that's the sermon for today. Let me meet every challenge. Because just like Swamiji said, every one of the challenges that comes to us is coming to us so that we can expand beyond it, greet it with the presence of God, with the consciousness of God. It's hard. Swamiji, in, in, again in, his, um, in another commentary on this reading, he said, let's face it, we come into this world and we have to, we have to be involved with our ego. We have to learn how to walk, how to use this body, how to interact with other people, Swamiji's words. He said, this is not easy, let's face it. He said, life is an obstacle course. Well, that's exactly right. So we have to have the energy and the courage to find our way down that obstacle course, to meet each obstacle with God's love and to let go of, in that moment, our attachments, our desires, our reactivity. No, I won't even notice if there's negative, I won't even see it if there's negative energy coming my way until the moment where that's true. You don't even notice it. That very source becomes an experience of love. You know, there's a woman who I don't know how many of you know her because uh, she hasn't been so involved in the congregation uh, to be interactive, but some of you will. Her name is Vani. I don't know if she's watching now. She's in India, but I'm just going to share a little bit of her story. She went to India just a week and a half ago, I believe, to help her family empty out her mother's home. I think her mother passed or was moved somewhere else, I don't know. And after being there just a day or two, she went to walk down three steps out of her mother's house. She fell and she fractured her ankle. Every, the ankle is one of the most complex joints in the body and every bone in it was splintered. Um, not exactly the trip that she had planned. So she had a major surgery, this is just last week, and they put in pins and plates and the recovery will be long. And Lahari and I got involved with her over email and we sent her uh, two affirmations. And we said to her, practice these affirmations, say them repeatedly. There were other things that we suggested. Not necessarily a life every day that Vani or many of us, certainly not me, would have lived repeatedly living with an affirmation, repeatedly having Swamiji chanting Om in the background. You're lying there, you can't do anything. So repeatedly remind yourself that you are a flowing river of boundless energy and power, or whatever those words are. I am well, I am strong. I am a flowing river of boundless energy, close enough. But I, this morning, it came to me, and I hope Vani's watching. Here she had this very difficult thing happen to her, very difficult, very painful. Suddenly her life will be very different for a long while. And I thought, if she just does that, if she just constantly repeats the affirmation, bring God's love into every moment, greet every challenge with the consciousness 
of God's presence, this could be one of this could be the greatest gift imaginable in her life. It could be the transformation that allows us to realize I and my father are one. It could help her transcend. I'm speaking about her, but in a moment in the minister's room, I was just sharing this story because it came to me. And then I said to Helen, or me, with anything and everything, just like greeting somebody who's coming into you like this, heart wide open, no defenses. I heard um, Anandi or Diana, I'm trying to remember, tell a story, but I've heard a couple of stories like this about Swamiji, where they were having a town meeting uh, at one point about changing the legal entity, I think it was, that Ananda Village was. Anyway, those specifics aren't important, but there was a man who came to the meeting who was just, he was totally against Ananda in every way, and he was very vocal about it. I don't like the people that are there. I don't want more of them there. He really uh, spoke very negatively and badly about Swamiji. Swamiji was there, by the way. And after the meeting was over, and it was a big force of negative energy, um, Swamiji just stood up. He went over the man. He, he said, hi, I'm Swami Kriyananda. He introduced himself. He held his hand out to shake it. And then Anandi said, um, he said to the man, and look at this suit. What do you think of this suit? I just got this suit for $50 in England. And there were a few more words. He wasn't mocking him. He was just sharing, just being Swamiji after this man had been so verbally abusive. And as this little group was walking out, I'm looking back at Asha because I have a feeling she must have been there, but I'm telling the story as Anandi told it. The man, start, the man goes, and look at this suit. What do you think of this suit? Mocking Swamiji. And everybody heard it, everybody. And Anandi said, I was so irritated with that man and I wanted to turn around and tell him, but Swamiji was just walking out beautifully, so we all just walked out. She said, but I think many of us were so offended. And when Swamiji got out, just in the sweetest way, Anandi said again with no mocking, but he turned and he said, look, what do you think of this sports coat? I got it for $50 to his little group of people. Totally unaffected. Totally. Imagine that not reacting, living with the awareness of God's consciousness all the time. That's what we need to do. That's what Jesus is saying to us. Be ye therefore perfect. And we can be. Again, let me say, he wouldn't ask something of us that's impossible. Would Krishna say to Arjuna, be thou a yogi? Same thing. No, he's saying to us, you have it in you. Start practicing it as many times in the day as you can. I am a child of God. My guru is here. My guru came and found me. And he is walking me through life into God's love, into God's light. Because really, the... <laughs> The bottom line is, in the end, that's all there is. It's God's light, God's love, God's peace, God's joy. And that's where we're all headed. And we can get there. Swamiji says, the path to self-realization doesn't happen in one leap. It's a series of moment by moment making the choices that will lead us into that light, that will take us to, in the end, all there is. So we bring it into our lives as reminders that this has been asked of us, this has been commanded of us, and we will do it. The uh, reading before 
the actual affirmation today on courage. It was just perfect. It's, and the, the energy in the chance of what it means to seize it with all our might. You just repeat those words and you feel that energy and know that if God has asked it of us, then we can, we can go there. And we do it, as Swamiji says, step by step, day by day, moment by moment, keep choosing the light, keep choosing the light. Don't let those negative thoughts in. Don't let anybody who's teasing us or is treating us badly, love them, love them, honor them, pray for them. Because every bit of meditation, every act of service, every act, this is why we say yes to serving, takes us closer and closer to that goal that is just right in front of us. The guidance is right there. The path has been made clear. What a blessing for all of us. Bless you.